Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the fifth episode of The Hedanted, and I'm super excited to welcome Brian Vaughn on the call. Brian, hi. Hi, Mikhail. And, nice to be here. And also Andre Kiska. Hi, Andre. Hi, Mikhail. Brand and I, our history goes back to 2008-2009. He's a Microsoft, ex-Microsoft employee and a veteran and an executive. Uh, he also graduated from the University of Virginia from the Darden Bus uh, Business School. And now uh, he's running uh, Steve Balmer's org, the 11th richest man in the world, uh, Balmer's uh, group uh, that he's joined in 2014. Andre, thanks for co-hosting this episode with me. Great to have you here. Um, Andre is Forbes 30 under 30, also University of Virginia alumni or alumnus, and a partner at Credo Ventures, a company that invests, we can say now globally, in, in uh, mostly technological deals. Guys, great to have you here. And we're going to start with, usually we start with the podcast with two quotes. This time it's going to be for um, one person who is actually Brand's boss, Steve Balmer. One of them is easy. And uh, when, uh, when I was researching Steve even more, uh, the quote goes, great companies in the way they work start with great leaders. And the second one, and Brand, you're going to laugh at it, is that it says, I've never thrown a chair in the room those <laughs> and we will we'll have a chat about that but we also chat about we will have a, we will have a discussion around leadership about you joining balmer's group especially when your career in microsoft was going so well so let's go back to that uh 2008 you are at virginia campus uh, you're hiring me i'm joining microsoft to your org at that time you're running the corporate finance and planning organization being responsible for over 60 billion dollars reporting and analytics right and then i leave the us for personal reasons you continue going in microsoft making it all the way to a cfo position of a marketing and and business development uh, organization and then 2014 suddenly i see in the news and i see and i hear from my friends and and some microsoft is that you are leaving Microsoft and joining uh, Steve Balmer's group. What happened? How did all of this happen? You had such a promising career at Microsoft. Yeah. Uh, so, so great, great question, Mikhail. And and uh, I, I like the the quotes you you started uh, started the segment off with. Um, uh, so, a little, yes, myself and my my path there at Microsoft. Uh, once we we parted ways. Um, you know, I had a, a really good career at Microsoft, uh, loved the company. I still love the company. It's a, it's a fantastic company. Um, as I sort of grew and developed at Microsoft, um, part of my, my role was, uh, helping directly support Steve and a lot of the analytical projects he was working on, a lot of long range planning projects he was working on. Right. And, uh, you know, was fortunate that I developed, a, a, you know, a great deal of trust uh, with him. Uh, we had mutual trust mm -hmm. where uh, each of us uh, trusted the other to, uh, to, to really get things done um, on any given, any project or, or deliverable at Microsoft. Um, when Steve retired from the company, I was uh, obviously really really sad to see him go um, because I think he was a great leader and did great things at Microsoft and really, um, you know, set the foundation uh, for, or for uh, what Microsoft is today. Uh, but I was very happy mm -hmm. to go on with my career at Microsoft. Um, right. I was working for great leaders at Microsoft. Um, I was reporting to Amy Hood, uh, the CFO of Microsoft. She's still the CFO. Um, and, uh, really having, you know, a, a really fun time still working at Microsoft, even without Steve, um, we were working on some really exciting projects mm -hmm. on, uh, sort of moving Microsoft forward into its next era and phase. So, uh, you know, I, as sad as I was to see Steve go, 
I was equally excited uh, for sort of the next chapter of chapter of Microsoft and to be part of that. All right. Uh, if you fast forward a couple of months, um, all of a sudden I received an email from Steve saying, "Hey, it would be great if we could uh, catch up and and have lunch." And mm-hmm. I said, sure, absolutely, it would be phenomenal to catch up. Um, so, uh, Steve and I had lunch and, um, you know, at that time he, he pitched this idea of, uh, a next set of projects that he wanted to work on outside of Microsoft. Um, he and his wife, Connie are extremely passionate, uh, about philanthropy and, um, enabling everyone to have an equal chance right. and shot in US at the American dream. Um, so they wanted to ramp up their phil- philanthropic efforts. Mm-hmm. Um, Steve had this idea about a, a government data project that he wanted to start. And um, he needed someone to really help oversee um, his investments in, in Microsoft and, and elsewhere. Um, so he pitched this idea of me coming over and really helping him uh, start a group to, uh, to do all those things, as well as manage this new little uh, fun uh, organization that he had just purchased called the LA Clippers. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to ask you about that. <laughs> so, so is that a charity as well or? A <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was, uh, you know, really uh, sort of an exciting time, I think, for Steve, uh, sort of realizing his dream of purchasing an NBA team. Um, but he, had, he, he wanted to take on all these projects. And, um, you know, he was by himself with his administrative assistant who had uh, mm-hmm. been with him for 30 years. Um, so he really needed someone to, uh, to help, so- uh, run those, help run those endeavors. Um, so it was, you know, a great opportunity for me to work with someone I really respected. Um, and it was a real opportunity for me to build something. Did Um, he, did he talk about the Clippers at their launch during the launch already? That that must have been like 2012, 13, something like that. No. Yeah, it was, it was literally right after he had purchased the Clippers. Oh, that was after. So 2014. I, when I joined Steve, he had already purchased the the Clippers. Mm -hmm. He had literally just purchased the Clippers. Um, so it was, uh, yeah, very exciting time. And, you know, for me though, it wasn't an easy, you know, if I look back now, I, I kind of say, wow, I, you know, it was an easy decision to, to join Steve. Um, but it really wasn't, it was a really tough decision that I spent a lot of time thinking about. Um, my wife and my family, uh, you know, were part of that decision as well. Mm-hmm. Um, it was not a it was not an automatic you know yes i'll leave microsoft uh, because i had built a great career at microsoft right. and uh you know really had a great team uh there supporting me and was working for a great management structure mm-hmm. so what was the biggest factor in the decision at the end to switch to the Palmer group if you were to name one yeah a really good question um and you know i talked about building And, um, for me, it was really the opportunity to build something new with someone I really trusted. Um, you know, I had the trust level with Steve. He also put a great deal of trust in me. Um, and you know, it was literally starting from scratch. Um, you know, um, it's, you know, when you're, uh, working at a company like Microsoft, and you're trying to do something for the CEO, it's, uh, it's very easy to get it done. Um, when you're outside of Microsoft and you're trying to get um, internet service set up for a new office, um, they don't care if your name's Steve Ballmer. It's still going to take six weeks to get <laughs> internet service set up. So it was an entirely uh, new dynamic outside of Microsoft. But you know, for me, it was really... Um, the opportunity to, you know, in essence, go to a startup and, and build something new. Mm-hmm. 
Um, Brand, I, I dare to say that I know you well. I know Steve's uh, working attitudes and you know moods and 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 whatnot from our work at CFP and corporate finance. You guys are the exact opposite. He is the rocket. He is you know very combustive. He is very fast. You take time to rethink the facts, the numbers, and everything. I always wondered how come you click so well. What's the magic? <laughs> well, you mentioned numbers, uh, Mikhail, and a lot of the the magic is around numbers. Um, you know, Steve and I are both, uh, you know, what he would call numbers guys. Yes. Um, you know, we believe in in numbers. We believe in good analytics, and um, you know, we try not to let emotion uh, rule our decisions. Mm -hmm. You know, you know, Steve. Uh, is a very passionate guy. Um, but it, when it comes to hard decisions, um, he's always going to approach decisions analytically um, and really use numbers to help uh, help him make decisions. And you can really see that in initiatives like uh, USA Facts, which um, is now gaining traction out of the Bomber Group under the, the leadership of Poppy McDonald. Right. Um, it's fantastic fact-based uh, initiative to really help people in the U.S. make really good decisions about their government and their leaders. I remember Steve running through the hallway, throwing papers with numbers everywhere, you know, the analytics that we've done, screaming at KT. And at the time, Chris Little, making them all of them sit down in the hallway and, and go numbers by numbers. So I absolutely agree with the analytic part of his heart it's it's heavy you would not expect it so it's not the chairs you're throwing it was the papers the, <laughs> i don't know that's you know has he thrown a chair <laughs> very much doubt it <laughs> no i don't think he's thrown a chair no <laughs> i mean again he's he's you know uh, it, it was interesting when um the nba season restarted in the bubble mm -hmm. um And people were really asking. They they wanted um, some of the TV cameras to to focus on uh, the owners because people really love to watch Steve watch a basketball game because he really enjoys it. You know, he's a fan mm -hmm. and he's a person, um, and it really resonates with people. Um, so I think sometimes that that you know, passion could be mischaracterized like, like this, uh, you know, throwing a chair, urban, urban myth, I'll call it. Um, but he's definitely a, a passionate guy and, uh, that comes out in everything he does, you know, whether it's the Clippers or USA facts or, you know, what he did at Microsoft. Mm -hmm. But he's also a family guy. I mean, I believe this year he's going to celebrate 30 years of marriage or, or he has done already looking at looking at this marriage so uh, he's got two three boys or kids and yeah he's uh, you know he he has a, a fantastic family yeah. he really does yeah. um and you know it, 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 part of the uh fun in uh joining him outside of microsoft was the opportunity to get to work with uh his his partner uh connie bomber of the past 30 years so his his wife um and uh you know it's uh it's been fantastic to to get to know them a little better and mm -hmm. um you know you could not find a, a finer family for sure uh so you've joined balmer's group right as a cfo now recently two years ago if we can call it recently uh you've became the coo and still a cfo well it's kind of <laughs> Or you so everything. When we, when we started the organization, um, it was literally three of us. Uh, well, four of us, I'll, I'll say, because um, it was it was Steve, uh, his wife Connie, um, uh, Steve's assistant uh, of again of thirty thirty plus years, and and myself. Mm -hmm. uh, so when you have uh, you know four people, you sort of say, well, what do you want to be called? Well, what do you want to be called? Uh, so you develop titles that way. Um, but as we've grown a little and gotten a little more professional, 
Um, we've, uh, you know, got a little more, we've brought a little more diligence to sort of how we think about the organization and, uh, mm-hmm. the titles people carry. So as, has my fundamental job changed? No, not a whole lot. Um, but, uh, the organization itself has continued to grow and get a little more mature. So, and the idea was, yes, around equality and so on, around helping people who do not get the resources or who do not have the resources and so on. Uh, there might be a misunderstanding in terms of the capital you guys are managing. That's not all Steve's money. That's just a portion, but then it's a little bit blurred. Where else is he active? Well, I mean, the you know, I think you see it uh, sort of in in the newspapers. Um, uh, you see it from from grantees who are who are getting grants from from uh, Connie and Steve. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, he's extremely active uh, in really uh, the philanthropic area. I mean, that if you if you talk about where is uh, where are Steve and Connie's money going. It's really going into philanthropic efforts um, primarily, mm-hmm. uh, and uh, the other big area that it's it's started going into uh, over the ca- past couple of years um, is uh, building a new arena for uh, the Clippers in uh, Inglewood, California, mm-hmm. um, right outside of uh, Los LA, Angeles. Yeah. Um, but in terms of you know, outflow of, of, of money and helping others, you know, it's really our philanthropy organization. Um, we've got a great leader there, Terry Ludwig, um, who came on board, uh, gosh, I guess almost two years ago now. Um, and she's really helping Steve and Connie, you know, manage that outflow of funds um, into uh, all of their philanthropic uh, endeavors. So a quick question on your transition from Microsoft to the Bolner Group. You mentioned that you know it was basically going from a large corporation, one of the largest, to a startup of four people. So what was it like for you uh, going from such a large organization to connecting your own internet and waiting six weeks to to get it done? Can you describe you know how did the transition go? How did you feel? Did you ever regret it? Um, well, so one thing that was very interesting, um, I had to, at times send myself emails to make sure my, my email was working because (laughs) at Microsoft, I had become accustomed to, uh, you know, sending and receiving probably between six and 800 emails a day, depending on the day. Um, and all of a sudden when there are a few people and, uh, you know, you're just getting started, um, maybe you're getting two emails a day. You know, it's, it's, it's generally, you're spending a lot of time leaning out of your, your office door and yelling down the hallway to the other person rather than, than emailing. Mm -hmm. Um, so it was a big cultural transition. I was used to this, um, you know, extremely fast pace at Microsoft, um, extremely tight deadlines in terms of deliverables and just a high volume of meetings and email and just going from that to some days, you know, you're, you're working in silence on your own and, Mm -hmm. you know, you don't have meetings, you, you receive two emails. Um, so it was just a, a completely different change in, pace. And quite honestly, it was, it was hard to adjust to that. Um, you become a little addicted to the adrenaline of, you know, what's the next big deliverable, you know, what's the next big deadline. Um, and you know, it, it becomes almost like an addiction. Uh, so you, so once you withdraw from that, it's, it's like withdrawing from, from, you know, uh, almost a drug. Um, and it's a little, a little challenging because you are used to a really extremely busy pace um, and then it's gone. Um, and it's also hard, you know, when you can't uh, send an email and, and get tech support on the line. <laughs> <laughs> and so as- aside from uh, sending uh, emails to yourself to make sure the inbox is working, were there any other sort of coping strategies when you went through the transition to a slower environment uh, that wasn't as fast paced? 
Well, it really gives you a time to think as well. You know, when you are in a fast-paced environment, you're making decisions, you know, in a very quick way, oftentimes without really thinking, um, you know, what are the long-term consequences? You know, if I spent, you know, a day on this, would I come up with a smarter decision? Mm -hmm. So getting away from that environment really allows you to put real thought and effort into what you're doing. Um, You know, I would spend literally, you know, days and weeks um, refining my, my model to look at, uh, uh, to sort of monitor Microsoft, um, on behalf of, of Steve, I would spend, you know, weeks on this government data project that was at that time, just an idea in, in, uh, in Steve's head, or I would, you know, do research, um, reach out to other folks in the industry, um, and try to find people who had, who had sort of done this, uh, done this path or gone down this path before on government data. So it was really, um, a fundamental change in, in sort of the way I, I thought and executed. Um, and it was really good. It was really good being able to sort of thoughtfully approach things, um, without a, a hard deadline looming. Um, there's a lot to be said for that. And I think um, it produces some really good, good results when you can really uh, stop and think before you execute. Right. It's almost impossible to actually imagine working for Steve and saying, I am in a slow environment. <laughs> you you well, know how I know him from working with him. It's. Well, if you look at a lot of, uh, you know, Steve's interviews that he's done, um, you know, he tells people, look, I'm retired um, and he is retired. Uh, he, he may be the busiest retired person uh, I've ever met, but, um, you know, I think that's part of the mental mindset. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I take my time, do the things I want to do in the way I want to do them uh, rather than be beholden to um you know, uh, uh, board of directors and shareholders. Right, right. Well, uh, we know Connie has been involved in his org since the beginning, right, heavily. What about your wife, Ruth? Has she has she approached you and say, well, you know, maybe it's a good idea for me because she was before running the family, right, your family. So has it happened that she would start being interested in charity and uh, and things associated? Yeah, well, it's it's uh, that's a very interesting question, Michael. I've I've never had anyone ask me about that before. Um, so she is interested mm-hmm. in in, in uh, philanthropy and charities. Um, her uh, charities of of choice tend to be uh, animal related. Mm-hmm. Uh, so she she does a lot in trying to help those out. But the one part, the one area where she's really gotten involved uh with what we do at the bomber group is the clippers she's become uh an incredible la clippers basketball fan (laughs) Uh, to the extent that you know when a game's coming on she's got her jersey on or her t-shirt on you know she's on the edge of her seat Mm -hmm. and um you know she's just waiting for uh you know one of the players you know she she loves uh, Mm -hmm. montrez harrell uh, on the Clippers mm-hmm. and, um, you know, she's following his stats. Um, you know, she's critiquing every play. Uh, so for her, you know, she's become an incredible, uh, NBA basketball fan and, uh, you know, follows the, the Clippers as a, as a very loyal fan, which is, uh, which is pretty interesting. It's a uh, question that comes to my mind right now is uh, you guys will have a new NHL team in Seattle. Yes, the Kraken. The Kraken, exactly. I was going to ask you about the name. How do you feel about choosing the name? Because there's some controversy around that. And also where the dead would make uh, Ruth switch to watching Isaac instead of having a local, very good NHL team. Yeah, you know, she has not gotten into into hockey. Uh, she's more more a basketball, right? Uh, and she's always watched college basketball. This is sort of her first intro into into pro pro ball. 
Um, yeah, NHL, um, you know, there's a lot of excitement in, in Seattle around uh, the NHL. I think the Kraken name is really pretty cool. Mm-hmm. Um, I think uh, uh, they've done a great job with the design on the, the logos. Yeah. Um, so who knows? Maybe she'll become an NHL team uh, fan as well. Well, back to the lunch that you had with Steve, when he talked about Clippers, since you're mentioning Clippers, was there a job for you to do with the newly acquired team? Uh, not so much a job with the team. So, um, you know, Steve had uh, people who were managing the team from a, a basketball perspective and a business operations perspective. What he really wanted was someone he could trust um, acting as uh, sort of a, what I'll call a, a treasurer and an auditor uh, for the team. So really in an objective set of eyes, um, just helping him watch over his financial in- investment mm-hmm. in the clip. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, they've, they've built a, a fantastic team there. Um, you saw, uh, Lawrence Frank, uh, yeah. uh, just received the executive of the year award mm-hmm. for the NBA. Um, and, uh, Gillian Zucker who runs their business operations, uh, does a fantastic job there. So they certainly don't need me helping with any of the decision-making there. Um, but I do act as a resource, uh, on the financial side, uh, for them and sort of an interface, a financial interface between, their operations and Mm -hmm. uh, our group operations. Has his leadership style in terms of his feedback on the work done changed? And what I'm referring to when we used to submit uh, the analytics for usually the quarter earnings and and so on, the the saying was, if we don't hear from Steve, everything is positive, everything is good. Is he still the same, that he remains quiet if he's happy? Yes. Or can he give Um, positive feedback? He, he does. Um, mm-hmm. and it's, it's interesting because, um, you know, a, a lot of people, if they don't hear feedback, then they think, Oh, something's right, wrong. Right. Uh, but for a lot of people, um, you know, I, I'm like that too. Um, if something's good, I just say, Oh, great. And I sort of go along and sometimes I forget to say, Oh, by the way, you know, those of you who just sent that to me, um, excellent work. Uh, it's great. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I think, uh, a lot of us are like that. If we, if we like something, it's great. We don't comment on it. We just go to the next thing. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. Um, uh, oh, this, this episode is uh, one of a kind, by the way, because I think this is the first time ever that there will be a podcast of three people from the same university chatting across two two different continents um a question relates to uva you graduated uva in 1999 i did nine years ago in 2008 from darden andre 2009 we're all connected to the school we used to recruit together brand at school if you remember are you still getting involved with the activities of the institution yeah, great. I, uh, great question, uh, Mikhail. Um, and so, to also to to clarify, I I actually graduated from UVA twice. Um, right. In 1989, uh, I uh, graduated uh, with my undergraduate degree um, in commerce from UVA. So, uh, also attended the the McIntyre School, uh, like Andre, mm-hmm. and uh, 99 from Darden. Um, so. I was really involved with Darden when I was at uh, Microsoft and really helped um, kickstart some of the Microsoft efforts to recruit at, uh, at, at Darden. Mm-hmm. Um, I really missed that when, when I left uh, UVA or when I left uh, uh, Microsoft. Mm-hmm. Um, I've started to get involved with a new organization at uh, the University of Virginia, the Jefferson Scholars uh, uh, organization, um, and have started supporting that, uh, with, with my time and, and a bit of my money as well. Um, and for me, it's a great way to stay involved with UVA and, uh, really help, uh, uh, UVA attract some of the best, uh, 
talent out there to uh, attend the school. So yes, still still have a, a, a close tie to UVA. All right. And so going back to your Darden days, uh, if you were to advise yourself something uh, as you are graduating from Darden, looking back at your career, what advice would you give uh, yourself uh, in those times <laughs> today? Yes. Well, I would give myself the advice I would give myself was the same advice uh, several professors gave us at Darden, which was really spend time and focus on the soft skills as well as the hard skills. And by soft skills, I mean um, interpersonal skills, uh, ability to write, ability to present. Um, ability to to lead and manage um, because so often in uh, school and MBA programs you know you really want to focus on uh, you know hardcore finance skills um, you really want to be able to build you know incredible models and uh, you know run a, a, a you know a discounted mm -hmm. cash flow um, which is certainly important but um, you know, perhaps even more important as you go out into the, the corporate world in particular, you really need those soft skills uh, to be successful. And so it, does that skill set that made you successful in Microsoft translate well to the skill set required to be successful in the Bomber Group? Does the, you know, are the strengths of that skill set translatable or is it sort of a new skill set you had to acquire or any particular skills you had to relearn or learn a new at the Palmer Group? Yeah, yeah, good question. Um, they are transferable, absolutely. Um, because as you build an organization, uh, as, as Steve and Connie were doing with Palmer Group, um, there are <laughs> lots of starts and stops. You go down one path, uh, then you have to go down another path or adjust. Um, and that requires a lot of soft skills and being able to uh, manage, communicate, uh, and really uh, think about how change is going to impact people and an organization. So very much like a, a corporate environment from that perspective. Um, so I, I think, you know, for all people who are, are getting their MBAs, you know, it's important to have those hard skills Um, but it's also important to have the soft skills and it's also important to always approach and think of things from a broad business perspective, not just from a finance perspective or a marketing perspective. Um, and that's one thing that, you know, really helped me at Microsoft and helps me today. I, I don't approach problems, you know, from a financial perspective, I approach them from a business perspective and then narrow in on uh, the financial angle. I I thought and I was kind of hoping you would you would ask about the proper graduation at UVA and streaking the lawn and we would ask Bren whether he's done it. <laughs> <laughs> For all of you who are listening who are not familiar with this crazy tradition that UVA, uh, I'm not going to explain it on the podcast, but <laughs> I thought that you were aiming that. <laughs> it's, a, it's an interesting tradition. Um, looking forward, what's the big thing right now on your plan in terms of uh, helping Steve driving or, you know, within the Balmer group, what's, what's the best, what's the big thing? Right now, the big thing I'm working on is, uh, you know, the uh, arena in Inglewood. Mm -hmm. So uh, the new Clippers arena, I'm um, uh, part of the team there that's driving the development and construction of the new arena. Um, so that's taking up uh, a very large portion of my time uh, today at, uh, at Balmer Group. Okay. Um, looking back, if we don't, if we don't uh, look forward now, is there anything you would think that will happen differently? Like you, your expectations from that lunch that you had with Steve uh, were not met. You, you know, you would be not disappointed, but you would expect different outcome. Well, sure. I, I would have been disappointed, you know, had, had I not 
really been able to to help Stephen Connie build a large organization. Mm -hmm. if, if you know, well, I shouldn't say large organization. I would have been disappointed if I had not helped them build an impactful organization. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's really not about size; it's about impact. Um, so, you know, if if we had tried things and they didn't work, that's okay as long as we try something else. But if we had sort of given up on things, then that certainly would have disappointed me. But um, that's that's certainly not in in Steve or Connie's DNA, and it's not in my DNA. Um, so it's it's been a, a really a fantastic uh, six years. Mm -hmm. Well, it's uh, one of the chance that's not uh, that that's given once in a lifetime, right? It's, it's it's an incredible chance to work for somebody so so driven and so smart like Steve. Yes, um, it, it's really uh, very interesting and a lot of fun to to work with someone who's you know literally in in virtually any meeting the smartest person in the room, mm -hmm. uh, which uh, you know we got to work with. A lot of people like that at Microsoft, and um, you know, Steve is is certainly one of the the absolute smartest people I have ever met, um, and it comes through it comes through in many ways, uh, and it's a lot of fun to to witness that firsthand. Do they Heyman and Bill uh, work together on any projects? Um, I know we have partnered uh, with uh, the Gates Foundation mm -hmm. in several endeavors. Uh, so yes, there's a, a definitely a working relationship uh, there. I'm not uh, certainly not in the details of that, mm -hmm. but uh, our philanthropy team has been really good about uh, partnering with a number of good other organiz other good like organizations on on a number of initiatives. A uh, question. Uh, we we know now how you're spending time professionally. I know that a lot of time were, was taken at the time we, we, we were together working in, in Redmond. Uh, was also or were the activities of your boys? And then there was one more I was going to ask. Your ability to dismantle Breitling watch and put them back together. Are you still a vivid collector? Yes, so I am still uh, an extremely passionate uh, watch collector. Yes, Miguel, um, that is is certainly uh, sort of my my primary hobby and mm -hmm. uh, where I spend a lot of my time. Um, I just got to visit this this week uh, a good friend of mine who uh, runs a, uh, a a watch and and clock. Uh, retail and, and repair shop here in, in Virginia. Um, and, uh, was able to, to catch up on, on a lot of, uh, fun topics around watches. I was able to pick up a few vintage watches and, uh, it's, it's a lot of fun. It's a great hobby and mm -hmm. uh, I still love it. All right. So one of the last questions of the podcast uh, is, is, are usually two questions. I'm going to ask them and then also give Andre a uh, space for any additional questions that he might have. One of them, if, if you had the option, if you have the possibility to manage any company in the world, basically the board would come to you and would say, here you have the company and do not whatever you want with that, obviously, but it, it's yours and you can manage it. What would be the hottest company for Brand Vaughn at this moment? <laughs> oh well, you know it's it's a question of of passion. There are lots of hot companies out mm -hmm. there that I would love to be associated with, but you know if you go back to the passion, um, you just talked about watches. I would I would love to uh, uh, manage a watch company. For me, that would be one of the more exciting things I could do. Um, but, I certainly wouldn't wouldn't leave my current job to do it, but um, <laughs> if I had to make a choice and had to to run any sort of company, I would love to run a, a Swiss watch company. Mm -hmm. That would be uh, sort of a, 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 the dream of a lifetime for me in a lot of ways. And then the other question is, if you were to leave two notes behind you for the future generations, what would that be? What would be the message given to those that would read it uh two messages for the future mm -hmm. generation 
Yeah. Uh, wow. That's a, a, it's a loaded a question deep and, and good question, Mikkel. Um, you know, I think one message would certainly be around sustainability um, because uh, I think we need to do more to focus on sustainability um, from, uh, you know, an overall perspective, whether it's uh, environment, uh, food source, um, species, um, because that's what's going to sustain the, the future generations. So I think sustainability is is obviously a big message I would leave about, you know, look, we have to watch over and be stewards of, uh, of the earth or, you know, there's not going to be a good uh, place for our future generations mm-hmm. to live. And, you know, I think that the other one is, is, you know, it, it's certainly a, a cliche, but, but peace, um, you know, I think we see a lot of conflict um, in our world today you know, even in the U.S., you know, there's a lot of internal conflict uh, driven by uh, racial inequality. Right. Um, so I think it's important for us to find peaceful ways to resolve um, tough issues. Mm-hmm. Um, I think in the past, you've seen a lot of great examples um, internationally of that, but we've also seen, you know, firsthand some some very poor examples of that, which have impacted uh uh, certainly, um, um, Europe in a very negative way um, with the, the world wars. So, I think you know, peaceful resolution of conflict and sustainability mm-hmm. would be my two messages Great. to the future. Thank you. I can only wish this generation was learning those lessons as well. All right. Yeah. Yeah. For sure. Okay, for sure. Uh, Andre, if you have. Yeah, uh, maybe just one question from me, uh, just sneaking at the end. You know, you had had a very successful career. You spent a lot of time managing a lot of money. How has your relationship to money evolved over the years? Uh, and how has it changed from the shift of, from a large corporation to a nonprofit today? Yeah, that, that's, wow, that's a great question. Um, so uh, it's interesting because I think uh, a lot of people have a perception that if you have, you know, a lot of money, if it's either you personally and you've had good financial success or, you know, a wealthy individual, oh, well, why don't they just give it all away? Why don't they just, you know, help solve problem A, B, or C? Mm-hmm. And what you find is it's really hard to do that, Mm. Um, you know, particularly in the philanthropic space, um, you're working with organizations that are in many cases, extremely small. Um, They don't have the uh, capability to, um, you know, say receive a hundred million dollar grant because there are three people and, you know, the groups they're supporting in the community are, are relatively small. So, you know, you really have to spend time and invest in infrastructure to help support a lot of philanthropic endeavors. Um, and it's really tough to, 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 you know, use money in a way that's uh, efficient, productive, and in a way where you can track outcomes. And um, I think Steve and his wife are doing a great job of that. Um, but it is interesting, the mindset when you turn from, uh, maximizing shareholder return for a corporation the idea is to always make more money right. to uh, a mindset where um you know connie and steve's goal is really to uh, uh help others and give away money so um it's it's a a shift in mindset um but it's pretty exciting to really you know think about money flowing out rather than in to uh to help other people Right. Thank you, Brand. Uh, I think our time is over. Uh, and uh, we would like to thank you for your time. Thank you so much. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Mikhail. Thanks, Andre. It's been uh, really a lot of fun and it's uh, great to catch up again. Mikhail. Thank you. Great to see you for all of you who are listening right now or are watching us on YouTube. 
Uh, thank you for listening. You can catch us on uh, Facebook slash The Headhunted, then on Instagram at The Headhunted. You can also follow us on Twitter. Thank you for listening and for your support. And I'm looking forward to the next episode. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Bye.